On Friday, October 17th, in 1941, Mrs. Ross had invited her 71-year-old neighbor, Philip Peters, over for dinner. When he didn't show up on time, she went over to his place to check on him. But on entering his house, she was left completely stunned. She found Philip dead on the ground, and his blood splattered all over his place. Who would kill a wise and kind 71-year-old man who everyone loved? Was this a killing by someone who knew him, or a random attack? Welcome back to Mysterious Hook. Today, we'll be looking into the case of the Denver Spider-Man, which not only stunned the city of Denver, but the complete state of Colorado. If you haven't subscribed to our channel already, please consider subscribing. Let's reveal this twisted mystery without any further ado. This case begins in the famous city of Denver. Denver, the state capital of Colorado, is a historic American metropolis. Denver is famous for its collection of world-class museums, first-rate breweries, and historical landmarks. The Denver Art Museum, a cutting-edge facility renowned for its collection of indigenous artworks and the home of renowned Titanic survivor Molly Brown, are some of the historical landmarks that can be found around the city. Philip Peters was born in 1869, and he married Helen Peters, born in 1872, in the 1890s. In 1941, the couple were living in a small brick home located at 3335 West Moncrief Place in Denver, Colorado, and this had been their residence for the last four decades. Philip had served as an auditor at the Denver station for the Denver and Rio Grande Railway from 1891 until his retirement in 1930. They had one child, Philip Peter Jr., who was an adult, married, and residing in Grand Junction, Colorado. Helen and Philip were both avid music enthusiasts. Philip played the mandolin and was a member of a local Denver organization for guitarists and mandolinists who organized small concerts and practiced together. One could say that the couple led a pleasant, quiet, and modest life. Helen Peters fractured her hip in September 1941, and she had to stay in the hospital while recovering, leaving 71-year-old Philip at home alone. He visited his wife in the hospital every day, and his neighbors kept an eye on him, assisting him around the house and inviting him over for breakfast and dinner. Before that, a small update. Allow us to thank Athena Interior for sponsoring this video. They are proficient interior designers that provide high-quality products straight to our homes. It ranges from bathware, kitchenware, homeware with lights, rugs, and artworks. To visit their pool of collections, type athenainterior.com and boom, you will land into traditional and elegant decors. In addition to the vast collection, they also have professional customer service for listening to our concerns. Now, coming back to conclude the case. Peter was invited for a meal at the residence of Mr. and Mrs. Ross, his neighbors from across the street, on Friday, October 17th. Peter was late on this occasion which was unusual for him. Mrs. Ross then crossed the street to see what was delaying Peter and to make sure that everything was all right with him. When she went to the front door and saw there were no lights on inside the house, she grew worried. She knocked at the front door but got no response. She thought about breaking in, but she didn't want to do it alone. Suddenly, she saw her neighbor, Doris Burke, she immediately asked for her assistance in getting access to the house and suggested entering through the backyard. The two then climbed over the fence at the back to unlock the door. As Mrs. Ross entered the home and turned on the kitchen light, she discovered a horrifying scene. She saw gory streaks on the ground and shrieked at the sight of blood splattered up the walls. She peeked through the doorway into the front room of the house, but Philip was nowhere to be seen. When she entered the bedroom, Philip Peters was lying face down in front of her. Doris, who had also entered with her, was shocked at the horrifying scene. Both ladies were in a state of shock, but they soon called the other neighbors for help. Then, they finally contacted the Denver Police Department to report the murder. 
Captain James E. Childers, along with three patrol cars, arrived on the scene within a few minutes. They first took a look around the property to see if there were any clues that could help them find the murderer. Philip Peters had been struck 37 times with a blunt weapon, leaving blood splattered on the walls of the kitchen, living room, and bedroom where his body lay. Many of his wounds were lacerations to his forearms, indicating that he defended himself against an attacker as best he could. There was a shattered walking stick on the floor near the body, indicating that he had attempted to fight back. During the search, as authorities attempted to piece together a picture of the crime, they got rather perplexed due to a lack of information, particularly on the house's entry points. The neighbors were only able to enter the house through the back door, as all other windows and doors were shut and showed no signs of forced entry. A small, 8 by 15 inch fault panel was found in a closet in the back wall of an upstairs storage room, but it couldn't be opened, even though they tried many times. They did find this suspicious initially, but they thought it was too small for anyone to go through, so they ended up dismissing it eventually. In the kitchen, detectives discovered parts of a handgun on the floor and what seemed to be an out-of-place cast iron stove shaker. Assuming that the iron poker was the primary murder weapon, it was submitted to a laboratory for fingerprint analysis and any other possible forensic evidence it may have concealed. The cops initially suspected the motive to be robbery, but when they found $208 in unpaid profits and $24 in cash in the bedroom, they began to doubt this theory. Over the next few days, they found about $400 all around the house, making robbery even less plausible. Instead, they thought it might have been a revenge killing, but neighbors told the police that the Peters had no enemies and were well-liked and respected in the community after living there for so long. Captain James E. Childers and his team were in charge of the investigation, and they were under pressure to find answers quickly. By October 20th, the police had already arrested one suspect and were questioning others, but none of them seemed to be a viable culprit. The first suspect was arrested by Weld County Sheriff Gus Anderson. The man had a record of robbery and breaking and entering. At the time, he had suddenly been seen wearing a high-quality dark blue coat that stood out from the rest of his clothing. But when detectives checked if Peter's jacket collection had something similar to it, they realized it didn't. The man in custody was 64 years old, short, and considered too feeble to have violently attacked Peters. Finally, he was released. The other two suspects were similar too. One of them was a man who went door to door in North Denver begging for money. That man was never seen again after the day of the murder. So, the police thought he was just a beggar who had left. The stove shaker was returned from the lab, and it had no fingerprints on it. But small spots of blood confirmed to the authorities that it was the murder weapon. In many ways, this investigation took one step forward and two steps back. Police had disproved the robbery theory, but on the other hand, they now had no suspects. The authorities said in a press release that the killer took time to wash his hands and clean the murder weapon, so he had definitely had enough time to rob the house. If he really wanted to rob Peters, they wouldn't have found so much cash and other possessions still in the house. The motive behind the killing still confused them. The investigation had halted by spring. Despite an extensive investigation, the police had no leads. After Mrs. Peters returned from the hospital, things began to escalate. On the 1st of February, 1942, Helen Peters returns to West Moncrief Place. She was alone in her 40-year-old home. Her future was uncertain at 68 years old and recovering from a fractured hip, so she hired two nurses to help her around the house. She was helped by Mrs. Edith Clark and Mrs. Hattie Johnson. Helen fell again a few weeks later and was hospitalized yet again with a broken hip. She returned home at the end of April, and the two nurses helped her around the house. Edith was the first one who reported suspicious things happening inside the house. She heard noises in the walls, 
and what she swore were faint footsteps in vacant rooms. Newspapers were missing from the front porch that she had seen earlier, and Mrs. Peters' food trays were moved or rearranged when she maintained she hadn't touched them. Edith wasn't alone in noticing oddities. Mrs. Peters was hard of hearing, but Hattie Johnson, who had nighttime fright, could hear disturbances. Both nurses heard strange sounds on the regular. Mrs. Peters began to suspect that something was off in her home after learning of the nurse's accusations. One day, Edith Clark contacted the police after seeing a person in the stairwell. She also heard tapping sounds coming from over there. She had heard it previously as well, but had believed it was a woodpecker. But this time, she went into the kitchen and then to the upstairs stairwell door as it slowly opened. She saw a foot and a thin white hand appear at the door. She screamed in fear as the man ran up the stairs. Despite searching the property, the officers found nothing. Two police officers stayed in the house for 48 hours and found no evidence of an intruder. Edith Clark resigned after this incident. Within two weeks, Hattie Johnson also departed the house, telling the press she wouldn't stay at a haunted house. In May 1941, Mrs. Peters' son, Philip Jr., visited her and tried to convince her to move to Grand Junction. After her nurse's sudden resignations, she moved in with her son and his wife in June 1941. She stopped house utilities and left the home for the police to investigate. 3335 West Moncrief Place that had been Peter and Helen Phillips' home for so many years was now empty. But the strange occurrences continued after she left. Neighbors noticed the windows' blinds moving. They were lowered and opened at times during the day. Since the house was under investigation in an active murder case, people took notice of strange activities, and police received multiple complaints of a shadow walking around at night. Police eagerly responded to calls but found just vacant rooms. Two officers stood guard outside the house for five days, but it was uneventful. The stakeout ended on the fifth day, and they returned to the station with no new information. With Mrs. Peters gone, the patrol checked the property every day, sometimes following up on reports of movement in the windows, and sometimes merely as a matter of habit. The press quickly picked up on the house's peculiar happenings and began referring to the killing as a ghost slaying. The Peters house was now the ghost house of Denver. It stayed in the news for a very long time. The townspeople thought this was just the press making up a headline to sell a story, but the police were investigating a very real mystery. No one had seen or heard the killer. How was Peter slain in a closed house with no forced entry? The investigation was also quickly losing steam as they had no leads and no suspects. On July 30th, 1942, Detectives Roy Bloxham and William Jackson were patrolling West Moncrief. They parked in front of the deserted house, as had become customary by this point, and went inside to conduct their routine room searches. This time, however, they both picked up a faint sound coming from upstairs. The two men hurriedly climbed the stairs, ran into the bedroom, and entered the tiny back storage space. A pair of legs were climbing up into a small opening in the back of a closet, giving them just enough of a start to frighten them for a brief second. A pale, malnourished man was hauled out by them after they grabbed the dangling feet. He disliked the sunlight, was the color of a mushroom, and behaved like a spider that scurries for darkness when caught hiding under a stone. He was beetle-browed, wide-eyed, and pale as a ghost. String and rope were all that kept his rotting garments from falling apart. They did not try to fire after seeing the condition he was in. The man identified himself as Matthew Cornish and said he had moved to Denver in 1941 from Tonawanda City in New York, where he had worked as an advertiser. Detective Bloxham and Jackson then took him to the station. He stuck to this story for a few hours, right up until he was fed a cheeseburger with coffee. Then, 
After giving in, he revealed his real identity to be Theodore Edward Conies and told the police of two incidents from his life that led to his acquaintance with and subsequent murder of Philip Peters. On November 2nd, 1882, Theodore Edward Conies was born in Petersburg, Maynard County, Illinois. His father, Thomas Conies, a Canadian immigrant, owned and operated a local hardware store. Isabella, Theodore's mother, was a homemaker. They lived happily as a family until Coney's father died in 1888. It was a huge shock for his mother, who moved to Beloit, Wisconsin with her young child. When Theodore was diagnosed with tuberculosis several years later, his life got even more difficult. He had been an ill youngster for a long time. Scared of losing her only family, his mother, Isabella, spoiled her son. He enjoyed sports and aspired to play baseball, but his mother pushed him towards the softer, less physically demanding career of music. While the neighborhood lads swung bats on the school field, he sat at home, wrapped in his overbearing mother's protective blanket, learning to play the mandolin. The physicians had given him the gloomy prognosis that he would not live to reach his 18th birthday, so he dropped out of high school. Isabella Conies relocated to Denver, where she worked as a housekeeper, and Theodore resumed his music, with a large quantity of money left over from her husband's death. Unfortunately, not long after they arrived, she was duped by a con artist who convinced her to invest her husband's fortune and securities before stealing every last penny. The family was shattered as a result, and Theodore got a part-time job to help put food on the table, but it was a dismal living. Isabella Conies died in 1911, leaving Theodore both broken and alone. Theodore met Philip and Helen Peters through music. Philip and Theodore were both members of the same mandolin club. The couple noticed his difficulties coping after his mother's death and befriended him, frequently inviting him for dinner and offering him company. One of his friends introduced Theodore to the Denver Gas and Electric Company, where he began as a pipe fitter helper and swiftly advanced to the position of pipe fitter himself. He and his friend were doing well in this job, but they formulated a plan to become advertising men and quit the pipe fitting game to start their own firm. Theodore Coney was the company's public face, while his partner was the operation's brains. Unfortunately, neither side fared well in their responsibilities, and they quickly went bankrupt. Conies took off, leaving Denver and traveling across many states, working at various jobs such as insurance and advertising sales. Nonetheless, after battling it out, he eventually began to gradually drift away from society. In 1917, he sought to develop cheap gasoline leases in Texas, but failed again, leading him to become a full-time wanderer and drifter. When he eventually made his way back to Denver in September 1941, he was far from triumphant. He was nothing more than a homeless beggar, and his first stop would be at his old friend's place, the Peters. He hadn't seen them in nearly 30 years, but he knew he could always ask for dinner. After all, they'd been so welcoming to him over the years. In September 1941, Theodore Coney's who was nearly 59 years old at the time, arrived at 3335 West Moncrief Place just in time to watch Philip Peters leave with a neighbor. He was on his way to the hospital to see his wife. Instead of waiting for him, Theodore decided to swing around to the backyard and attempt the back entrance. As luck would have it, it was unlocked, so he strolled inside and helped himself to some food. He spent some time nosing around the Peters' house until, in an upstairs storage room, he discovered a little 8 by 15 inch ply wall panel in the top of a closet that functioned as a trap door into a tiny coffin-shaped attic that was 37 inches tall at the apex, 7 feet long, and 4 feet wide. Coney's resorted to the narrow crawl space in the rafters instead of leaving. It appeared to be a suitable place to spend the winter, he later told authorities. And this is exactly what he did 
for several weeks. When Philip was out seeing his wife in the hospital, he would leave the small space in the attic and move around the house. Mrs. Peters' condition was unknown to Coney, but the scenario worked in his favor. Every night, he would listen through a hole until he heard Philip snoring, then crawl out and go to the icebox, taking just enough food to not be noticed. He said he'd take it back to his nest, where he discovered fragments of an antique crystal set and a pair of headphones in one of the closets. He repaired it so it worked, and he listened to all of the music from the newscast. He used to go down to the restroom and shave with the older gentleman's razor. Slowly, when Coney's was feeling a bit bored, he thought of doing something funny to entertain himself. He began to follow Philip Peters throughout the home, monitoring his movements and hiding behind doors as he passed for pure enjoyment. On the afternoon of Friday, October 17, 1941, things took a drastic turn when he assumed Peters had gone out to visit his wife in the hospital. Coney slipped out of his cramped living quarters around 4 p.m. and headed to the kitchen to get some food. As it turned out, Peters was simply sleeping, and the noise from the kitchen woke him up, so he went to investigate. When the two men met, they were stunned to see each other. Coney stated that he was afraid of losing his sanctuary. Peters didn't recognize him due to the fact that he had changed dramatically in the last 30 years. Coney's noticed an ancient handgun hanging on the wall and grabbed it, hitting Peter on the head. Peter fell, but he got up and went to the dining room phone. Coney's followed Peter and punched him again when he stated he would call the cops. Peter was looking for the vials in which he had stashed some money. Coney's noticed him unlocking a drawer in the basement bedroom. He says he went in there with the stove shaker and he didn't know how many times he hit him. He just kept punching him till he stopped moving. After that, he cleans the iron porker and took some food with him. Then he scurried back to his hiding place rather than running away. Two hours later, he heard activity downstairs when Mrs. Ross, the neighbor from across the street, discovered Philip Peters' death. Later, on his homemade radio, he listened to the news about the crime. Since Mrs. Peters had trouble hearing, he stayed in the house after she got back, which made life better for him overall. His biggest problem, however, was when she was away after injuring herself again. He was nearly frozen to death because there was no heat in the house, but he still remained in his nest. He liked to go down and peek out of the windows, watching the postman pass by. He stated that no one had written to him in the last 25 years. He despised people on the street and would retreat to the attic whenever he saw them. When the townspeople witnessed blinds moving, papers being removed from the porch, or movements in the windows, Theodore Coney's unwittingly became the ghost of the Denver ghost slaying. Most people would have left the house with constant patrols checking the home, but Coney's felt different. He'd been in the attic for about ten months and did not want to leave. The following day, weird stories of the ghost slayer who had lived as a spider in the walls were all over the front pages of the neighborhood newspapers. The press was informed of everything by Captain Shoulders. Coney's told the police that he was sitting on the little false trap door when they first found it inside the home on October 17, 1941, and that he had held it shut with his body weight as they knocked on it before they dismissed it, thinking it was too small for a person to fit through comfortably. Both in his formal statement to the police and in a news interview he gave on August 2, 1942, he continues to offer a very detailed account of his existence in the attic of the Peters. In that attic, it was freezing cold in the dead of winter and excruciatingly hot in the summer, but that was all part of the price he was willing to pay. He had only once left the home throughout the ten months he had spent living in this cramped attic area, and that was in the middle of the night after Mrs. Peters had departed and the utilities were turned off. He used a toy shovel to gather some snow to fill a bucket with water. He stated that everything would have been okay and Philip Peters would still be alive today if he hadn't been caught robbing the icebox. He was six feet tall, 
but barely weighed 75 pounds when he was taken into custody. Police searched the residence where Coney's had been residing after hearing his confession, and one of them reported being knocked out by the foul odor. According to Detective Fred Sarnoff, a guy would need to be a spider to survive up there for very long. In relation to first-degree murder, Theodore Coney's entered a not-guilty plea. Foster Klein, the court-appointed attorney who represented him, said that while Coney's would not contest killing Peters, he sought to avoid the death penalty. This had been demanded by the prosecution from the beginning, but Klein was optimistic because the crime had not been planned and because of Coney's mental state at the time of assault. The actual trial took place over the course of six days at the end of October 1942. This was because Coney's was admitted to the hospital with pneumonia on September 21, 1942, and the original trial had to be postponed. Coney's got a psychiatric evaluation while he was being held in jail pending trial, and the results showed that he was fit to stand trial. Klein, however, pleaded with the judge to order an impartial investigation to gather proof that might spare him the death penalty. Coney's had to undergo a second examination after the request was granted, and the results were provided to the judge. Coney's was then referred to see Dr. Leo Tapley. Coney's was found once more to be in good enough condition to be tried in court. The county maintained its composure in the courtrooms throughout the trial, which was largely free of drama and theatrics. The jury was given 90 minutes to deliberate before returning its judgment on Halloween in 1942. Coney's was given a life sentence at the Colorado State Penitentiary with hard labor, and he escaped the death penalty. After the decision was announced, Coney looked at Foster Klein and said, I now feel secure. I'll live in a better house than I have in a long time. The Associated Press selected the now officially known Ghost Man Murder as Colorado's top news story for 1942 on January 1st, 1943. After finding his nest in the attic, Coney's earns the nickname the Spider-Man of Denver. Additionally, it took some time for him to lose his reputation as the ghost slayer in the media. In the end, Coney's passed away on May 16, 1967, in a prison hospital. He was 84 years old when he passed away, and he was cremated and buried in Mountain Vale Memorial Park in Cannon City, Colorado, in an unmarked grave. What are your views on this exhilarating case of the Denver Spider-Man? Was the trial and final sentence enough for Coney's or not? We'd love to know your thoughts in the comments down below. Do not forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Until we meet again, stay safe and keep watching Mysterious Hook.